My name is Conrad Ernest. I'm a professor in the Department of Health at the University of Bath in England. And I would like to talk about an article recently published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings titled Maximal Estimated Cardiorespiratory Fitness, Cardiometabolic Risk Factors, and Metabolic Syndrome in the Aerobic Center Longitudinal Study. The general purpose of our study was to examine metabolic syndrome as defined by the National Cholesterol Education Program, or the NCEP ATP3 guidelines, in the aerobic center longitudinal study where we have measures of maximal cardiorespiratory fitness. One of the things that we've been thinking about with metabolic syndrome is that it's a categorical measurement, which basically means that if you're above or below a certain cut, cut point, you will either uh, score a point for metabolic skin syndrome or not get a point for metabolic syndrome. For instance, systolic blood pressure, anything over 130 is considered a point for metabolic syndrome. So if you have a patient entering into your practice with a uh, systolic blood pressure of 148, and they uh, adapt a healthier lifestyle, start physical activity, practice uh, healthier behaviors, and they reduce their blood pressure to 131, technically they still get a point for metabolic syndrome. So we thought that a, a, an interesting way to look at this would be to look at it in terms of a z-score, which would allow us to use a cumulative measurement and um, give people credit where credit is due when they do show improvement, even if it doesn't move them out of the formal categorical measurement for metabolic syndrome. So the principal findings from our study were is that we looked at three levels of fitness, people who were basically sedentary. Uh, we looked at fitness categories where people showed a moderate de degree of fitness, and we sh looked at fitness categories where people showed a high degree of fitness. And we used three statistical models. One model accounted for age and exam year, and then the second model added in body mass index, smoking, alcohol intake, and family history of cardiovascular disease. And the third model actually looked at the present or participation in physical activity, uh, hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, and the presence of diabetes. And the, what we found in all three of our models, regardless of the model that we used, is that moving from a sedentary, sedentary category to a moderate fitness category had a substantial uh, effect at reducing the prevalence of metabolic syndrome within our group. Uh, and then moving to the high fitness category, we moved it even further. But the important clinical point to note here is that moving from a sedentary category to a moderate fitness category does not really take all that much. It's literally the ability to move uh, two to four minutes greater in length on a standardized treadmill test. And these results can be achieved by simply uh, a consistent and regular uh, walking routine uh, rather than structured, structured exercise programs. What we wanted specifically look at in terms of how does this finding relate to clinical practice is that it's a common, commonly advocated that people take up physical activity uh, as a means of improving their health. And the nice thing about the aerobic center longitudinal study, it's a very rich database with uh, a very high patient population that actually went in and had um, uh, maximal cardiorespiratory fitness measured in a clinical setting. So what we know from this is that we are actually able to account for a fitness level with, for individuals and therefore uh, hopefully make more conclusive findings about the effects of physical activity or exercise participation on metabolic syndrome. Second step in this would be to actually look at what happens when a person changes their fitness level. If they started in the sedentary category and they move to the moderate fitness category, wh what would be the effect of moving this particular parameter um, uh, as an assessment for metabolic syndrome. Or even the reverse, if somebody was moderately fit and they regressed and moved to a sedentary lifestyle, would that number actually go up? The takeaway message from this is that even when you, a patient comes into your clinical practice and they don't show significant uh, reductions in a particular parameter related to metabolic syndrome, then that might move them out of the metabolic syndrome category. The fact that the cumulative measurement of all the factors related to metabolic syndrome can change differently from one patient to another. For example, one patient might take up exercise and have a more respo uh, greater response uh, in cholesterol, where uh, another patient might find a, more, a greater response in waist circumference. Interestingly enough, the greatest response seems to be associated with waist circumference in our particular study. But at the end of the day, uh, whether they move categories or not, the advocation for having patients continue to exercise on a regular basis or finding a way to incorporate physical activity into their daily lifestyle would still be the saleable message. We hope you benefited from this presentation based on the content of Mayo Clinic Proceedings. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. 
If you're interested in more information about Mayo Clinic Proceedings, visit our website at www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you will find additional videos on our YouTube channel, and you can follow us on Twitter. For more information on health care at Mayo Clinic, please visit www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.